news at six o'clock. The system of fast-tracking the deportation of foreigners who have been refused permission to stay in the UK has been ruled unlawful. The policy was challenged by an organisation, Medical Justice, which helps detainees. Healthcare in prisons is provided by the Department of Health, but the responsibility for checking on the health of detained asylum seekers belongs to the Home Office. But many immigration services are privatised and there's pressure to meet arbitrary targets for the number of deportations, which often occur before people's true medical conditions have been revealed. I wasn't feeling well at all, but nobody even cared about it. I wasn't treated like human, to be honest, because I've been pushed so far at the point which I felt like uh, I need just to end my life. The medical care in these detention centres falls far short of what they should be getting. I thought this can't be happening in Britain. I'm very ashamed of what we do to asylum seekers. If you put me into the position where I'm not allowed to, 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 to keep my painkillers with me, you are killing me. Lucy, not her real name, fled to the UK in 2005 from Togo. She had been tortured and worse by soldiers there. I was asked to go and see her on a Sunday and she was due to be deported two days later. I interviewed her um, and found that she had the following health problems. She had uncontrolled and untreated diabetes, uncontrolled hypertension, she was suicidal and had made a serious suicide attempt. She had undiagnosed and untreated vaginal bleeding. And her, the healthcare staff had deemed her fit to fly. Because of the inequality in the country and the dictatorship, we wanted a fair democracy in the country. And because the government wasn't offering us that, so I was organising meetings, just promoting the party. I was a target for them. On the night of the 31st May, I was asleep with my husband and I heard people knocking on my door very hard, you know. And uh, I get scared. I didn't want to open the door and they pushed the door hardly with the feet and the door was open. They start beating him up, and me also, you know, I get beaten. I start screaming. I was just thinking that, oh, maybe neighbors will come and just help us, but nothing happened, no one, you know. And um, I was wearing my, like, night dress, and The burden of proof to show that they are a refugee or that they should be allowed in this country is, is on them. So they need evidence and often if people have come here, they've had to leave everything behind and they don't have any evidence. The only evidence they have is, is themselves and their condition and their bodies and, and their health. Um, and so that's where, that's where doctors come in and that's where medical justice comes in in terms of helping people present the evidence that they have that, they're not, that they can't present in an acceptable form to the court without the help of of medical justice or of other doctors. Frank Arnold and others founded Medical Justice five years ago. They trained volunteer doctors about how to take careful evidence from patients which could later hold up in a court of law. If you have scars that are strong evidence of torture in somebody you see, these can be useful in terms of getting somebody who is detained released. Sometimes it's relevant to ask about the age of a scar. Do people have any feel for the extent to which you can identify the age of a scar by examining it? People being tortured only get to this country after some delay, in many cases, not all. Yeah. So it is like as not you're seeing a mature scar over a year old. There are 11 detention centres in the UK. The management of detention centres and healthcare therein, in eight of the 11 centres, is private, run by one of approximately three or four security companies. Sometimes they directly employ the doctors and nurses who by statute must be available to those centres. Sometimes they subcontract. 
yet again. Are there not healthcare facilities in the, these detention centers? Yes, there are. But the problem is the need and demand that asylum seekers be removed places pressure on the doctors and nurses in that healthcare facility not to take complaints seriously, to say, oh, well, she's going to leave in a few days. There's no point in trying to do anything. Seventeen attempts have been made to deport Olivier, who fled to the UK from Cameroon. He has sickle cell anemia, and Jonathan Fluxman is concerned about Olivier's health while he awaits a decision about his asylum claim. Sickle cell disease of, uh, like myself, are under care of hematologist doctor. So in detention, you are, basically you haven't got an hematologist doctor or whatever. So they don't have the necessary material. So that was, it made my life very, very difficult because I was hospitalized every 10 days. Ali was detained in 2009 after he fled Iran and claimed asylum here. Ali had been involved in demonstrations in Iran and he still has marks on his head from where he was beaten in prison. On arrival in the UK, he was put straight into detention. Dr. Charmian Goldwyn's evidence helped Ali win his case to stay in the UK. Today, he's helping her to train new volunteer doctors. The doctor gave a report very, very, you know, uh, I can say careless about, the, about me. I objected to the whole, my case worker and she said to me, the doctor was not responsible for your problem and your, she, to, to say you've been really tortured or not. We see people for basically three different reasons. One is that they've got medical evidence of what happened to them before they came to the UK that's relevant to their asylum claim and which hasn't been documented and hasn't been taken into account. And we see them to, to document that evidence. Then we see people who are not receiving adequate care for their problems. So that could be physical or mental health problems, um, which often are getting worse in detention because of the, the, the circumstances in detention and also because of the health care that they're receiving there. And then the third group is people who have been assaulted or otherwise harmed in the UK in detention or on removal. The failings are very basic medically. And what we find much of the time is it's, it's almost like shining a light on a dark place. And as with many other environments where people are locked up and locked away, that is where the worst abuses take place, in secret. And although these places are not prisons, they are detention centres. The important thing to remember is that this is administrative detention, so people are being detained to make it more convenient to remove them. They're not being detained because they're dangerous, they're not being con detained because they've admitted any criminal offence. Wherever you find this kind of situation, precisely because detention is administrative, not as a result of conviction for a crime, it is therefore optional. Where then there is a duty upon the doctors and nurses, as embodied in the detention centre rules, to inform UKBA of persons who are not suitable for detention by reason of a history of torture, by reason of medical illness, by reason of psychiatric illness, by reason of being a child or a pregnant woman, we find all too often that the doctors and nurses working in these centres are so conflicted by their dual loyalties that what they then say or don't say is actively untrue and directly harmful to the people to whom they have a duty of care. The name's important, medical justice, because it does combine the concept of justice in the provision of medical care. And for this group of people, i.e. detained asylum seekers, what happens is when they lose their liberty, they often lose their right to health care. Under all governments, the need for the independent volunteer doctors recruited by medical justice has continued to grow. I started about a year ago and we were getting a couple of referrals a week. Um, we are now up to two or three referrals a day. It's probably about a thousand a year. They were quite a new organisation. In fact, we didn't have to exist before the way the, these people like Ali have been treated. So we all try to learn how to get this evidence and get it properly and write it down as well as we can. It's a tough challenge for doctors to help in this way. 
It needs training and much care to present detailed, objective reports which will be accepted in the courts. As doctors, I think we all share the desire to do the best for patients and to look after the most vulnerable in our society. I think that motivates a lot of doctors. The impact of getting involved is often profound and we find that more often than not our intervention leads to a positive outcome for the individual detainee or the family. Well, I think the best thing for all of us is seeing these people who we see allegedly end of process in the detention centres about to be returned there, then in the end being granted refugee status, being able to bring their families over, being able to finally build up a life and safety. I think seeing that is what makes all of us do this. We're just coming out of the High Court. Uh, we just had a decision that we've won our judicial review. We're very, very happy because it's going to protect some very vulnerable detainees from being snatched in the middle of the night and denied access to justice. The verdict also reinforces the GMC's guidelines, which state that treatment must not be refused or delayed and that doctors must treat every patient, whatever their origin, with equal respect. In general, the situation may be beginning to improve for people in Ali's position. After we published a dossier with 300 cases of people being assaulted on removal and in detention, there was an inquiry into it. And we had, at least from the numbers of referrals that we received, we had the impression that the number of um, assaults was going down. Um, we still get referrals for that though. So the problem is far from being solved. Um, but I think we've made some, some progress. I came here to see those people who have saved my life and uh, to show other doctors that those people who are in detention centers need their help. And uh, I thank you uh, people from medical justice who are fighting on behalf of people like myself. I just feel alive again. You know, I just feel like there's someone I can rely to. I'm not alone anymore.